Um, next we will hear from Julia Landweber. Julia Landweber is Associate Professor of History and of Women and, Women's and Gender Studies at Montclair State University in New Jersey. She received her PhD from Rutgers University. Her most recent publication in French Historical Studies examines the question of how the French adopted Arab Ottoman coffee and reimagined it as their, as their own national drink over the course of the 18th century. She's currently working on a book about the adoption of coffee in France to be called Embracing the Queen of Beans, How Coffee Was Adapted into French Medicine fashion and diet, 1660 to 1789. Her paper today is titled Making Coffee French, Establishing a Material Culture for Coffee in France, 1670 to 1780. Julie? Thank you, Elizabeth. When Arabian coffee first came to France in the mid-17th century, it was soon established as more than just a bean or a beverage. Early importers, an eclectic mix of merchants, scholars, and diplomats, brought across the Mediterranean their knowledge of an Arab or Ottoman coffee culture of associated objects, practices, and drinking spaces. In these same years, other Asian import luxury goods were also coming into vogue. Chinese porcelain, Ottoman sofas and robes, and Indian dressing gowns. Soon bundled with coffee in the social imagination, these items became nearly inseparable over the next century. Between 1670 and 1700, scarcity and prohibitive prices led ambitious artisans to create domestic versions of these imports using French resources. Also, starting in 1715, entrepreneurs decided to break Yemen's monopoly on coffee production and develop plantations of their own in the French East and West Indian colonies. While it makes sense that the earliest coffee services manufactured in France would imitate their Ottoman predecessors, and similarly, the first French coffee houses would be based upon foreign models, it is surprising that decades later, after coffee production had shifted decisively to the Caribbean and the cafe had become a French institution, these Asian themes persisted. Today's presentation, as Elizabeth said, is part of a larger project on the adoption of coffee into old regime French culture and diet. I will argue that in the process of adopting coffee, the French imbued it with an Orientalist culture of their own invention. So this odd little bean arrived bearing an assortment of genuine Ottoman, Chinese, and Arab associations. Once in France, merchants heightened its attractions by linking its use to fantasies of tuquerie and chinoiserie. Over the 18th century, this melange of concepts, some of them authentic, some of them invented, none of them visibly European, coalesced to transform coffee into a domestic French beverage. In the 17th century, a wealthy, non-aristocratic segment of French society began purchasing goods to assert themselves through taste in new ways. Novel exotic commodities such as coffee and chocolate had the potential to mark the identity of those who consumed them regularly. Importers and craftsmen soon learned that they could persuade customers that in order to fully appreciate coffee, in particular, they needed to buy more than just the beans. Coffee offered consumers a lifestyle combining sensual pleasure and worldliness. Today's brief talk focuses on the question of how consumers learn to adopt coffee into their life practices. And my goal today is to demonstrate that teaching consumers to appreciate these sensations would become the purview from the 1680s onward of the equally new art of persuasive selling. The earliest French texts on coffee, which were published between 1664 and 1716, established that coffee consumption required a complement of Arab knowledge, Turkish cooking utensils, and Chinese porcelain dishes. Between 1680 and 1700, French merchants started to think that a market existed for both imports and domestic knockoffs of these accoutrements beyond court society. Yet it was unclear how makers and sellers of these items, representing a wide range of guilds, might foster sales, not only of such an expensive novelty product, coffee, but of the even more frivolous material culture thought to accompany it. Now, tracing the evolution of old regime French food advertising can be tricky, as relatively few examples have been preserved apart from text-only newspaper ads. While British tea and coffee merchants of the same era were printing vivid trade cards featuring illustrations of Turks and Chinese and pagodas, French mer coffee merchants mostly did not try to seduce customers with visual reference to their products' exotic luxury import associations. 
However, I believe that if we broaden our interpretation of coffee advertising to include pitches for the implements that supported a coffee culture, uh, sales tactics do appear within a wide array of sources. Alternative loci for publicity include fashion prints, shopping guides, scientific publications, even novels and fine art. What Maxine Berg and Helen Clifford call, and I'm quoting here, the economics of persuasion, extended, I believe, beyond the formal advertisements of specific manufacturers and shopkeepers to the work of many sorts of people, physicians, inventors, artists, who from the 1670s all the way to the 1780s actively tried to sell the French public on coffee's attractions. An example for you. In the 1670s, uh, Levantine coffee, Ottoman couches, Chinese porcelain, porcelain, and all sorts of new Asian-influenced styles of clothing began appearing together in the equally new medium of the fashion plate. Both genders were shown enmeshed within a fashion system based on an eclectic mix of turquerie, chinoiserie, and other Eastern references. We see men and women drinking Arabian coffee, sitting on Ottoman couches, and wearing Turkish, Indian, Chinese, or Siamese robes. These plates, of course, are not really ads, but they engage many of the same concepts and accomplish some of the same goals as later advertising would do. They established fashion as an idea that anyone with money could aspire to, while at the same time demonstrating the appeal of all things Eastern to, for putting together the right look. Shifting our attention now to the accoutrements needed to do it right, we, uh, once coffee starts to become more widely available across France, so into the early 18th century, we find attempts at advertising such wares in trade cards after all. By the 1720s, metalsmiths trade cards featuring coffee pots and coffee grinders made of materials ranging from gold at the high end to pewter and iron at the low end show that coffee was diffusing across French society both economically and culturally. Though maintaining traces of its eastern heritage in pot shape, for example, coffee clearly was no longer exclusively a rare aristocratic luxury. However, a different environment, if we jump ahead a couple, maybe a decade or two, seems set to reclaim coffee's exotic and costly eastern associations. And I'm speaking, of course, of luxury goods establishments, such as Gersant's famous Paris shop, A La Pagode. And um, it and similar shops uh, had trade cards that featured import, excuse me, imported coffee implements and Chinese and also Japanese uh, porcelain and ceramics. Also in the 1730s, coffee drinking scenes started to become a subject for high art in addition to the more affordable engraved prints where they had long been a staple, such as the fashion plates. And I wonder, did these works, these uh, high, you know, high art paintings, also contribute to maintaining coffee's fashionability? Breakfast scenes painted by Boucher and Lancre suggest coffee was now an expected element of family meals, at least among the well-to-do. Yet, de Troyes' painting of a woman in Turkish undress drinking coffee from a Chinese porcelain cup, and Van Loo's famous 1755 portrait of Madame de Pompadour as an Ottoman sultana taking coffee, demonstrate that coffee remained closely associated with all the tropes of chinoiserie, turquerie, and sensuality established back in the 1670s. Lastly, we mustn't forget the cups and saucers so crucial for serving this hot beverage. The French porcelain industry traces its origins to the same taste for Asian imports that led to the adoption of coffee and new clothing styles. Beautiful Chinese porcelain, delicate, yet strong enough not to crack when filled with boiling liquid, was part of the original lure for the earliest French coffee adopters. By 1660, Marseille merchants were importing serious quantities of coffee beans for local use, and also by necessity they were importing Turkish pots and Chinese cups. Provençal potters soon saw in this development an untapped market for cheaper wares. But they lacked an ingredient, kaolin, the key to Chinese porcelain's heat-resistant strength, and that meant that early French coffee wares were fairly coarse. By 1700, however, French potters had managed to invent a new ceramic which so resembled China in its delicacy and brilliant coloration that it came to be celebrated as so-called soft paste or French porcelain to distinguish it from true hard paste Chinese porcelain. By 1750, a dozen of these manufactories operated around France. Most famous was Sèvres, which the royal court patronized up to 1789. So, Two examples 
of late 18th century French porcelain coffee services will serve to conclude my argument about how France adopted a non-European drink, linked it to an even more foreign material culture, and over time rendered both French. After Sèvres and its competitors established their product as equal to the finest Chinese porcelain, new cup designs proliferated. Two themes stand apart for their clever marketing potential. First, in 1778, the Comte d'Artois factory produced a coffee service decorated with portraits of the royal family. Each cup, pot, and caddy featured different individuals. It would clearly behoove buyers to not stop at just one cup and saucer when they could collect them all. And it makes me think of McDonald's. <laughs> Secondly, in 1783, the world's first manned hot air balloons were launched in Paris. Porcelain manufactories promptly plastered this news all over their cups and saucers. Some sets show the heroic takeoffs and landings. Others focused on the science, such as painting hydrogen generators on saucers. The Royal Co Portrait Coffee Service praised French monarchy and supported the Bourbon dynasty. The ballooning-themed cups and saucers celebrated French technical genius. Both designs encouraged a collecting mentality based on appreciation for French government, French ingenuity, and French commerce without invoking any thought for imported Asian luxuries. Moreover, these cups were now serving coffee overwhelmingly produced in French Caribbean uh, colonies. As these developments demonstrate, by the 1780s, both coffee and its material culture had been thoroughly domesticated. Thank you.